What do oxygen-transporting red blood cells, squishy lipid-storing fat cells, calcium phosphate-producing bone cells, wandering bacteria-eating macrophages, histamine-releasing mast cells, flexible collagen-secreting cartilage cells, and fiber-making fibroblast cells all have in common? They are all cells of connective tissue. Connective tissue is easily the most diverse tissue of the body. The cells that are found in connective tissues and the properties of the tissue as a whole vary widely in both structure and function. Perhaps it is this diversity that makes it so difficult to get a clear grasp of what, precisely, connective tissue is. Let's try to sort it out. First, some general features of all connective tissues. Like all other tissues, connective tissues are made of cells, plus the material those cells secrete. It is the specific cell types, and the nature of the substances those cells make, and the relative abundance of each that sets connective tissues apart from one another and from all other tissue types. When it comes to the anatomy of a connective tissue, here we find four notable characteristics. First, the physical components of a connective tissue. All connective tissues have three basic physical components that make up the tissue, namely cells, protein fibers, and a ground substance. In regards to their cells, as we have indicated, connective tissues present a wide variety of cell types and include cells that are very highly specialized in function. But herein is one of the most distinct characteristics of connective tissues. The bulk of the volume of connective tissue is not its cells, but the products those cells make and secrete, namely the protein fibers and their ground substance. The protein fibers and ground substance are collectively called the extracellular matrix. It is the extracellular matrix that accounts for the bulk of the volume of connective tissues. So, unlike epithelial tissues, high cellularity is not a defining characteristic for connective tissues. Second, location. Connective tissues occur throughout the body, but unlike epithelial tissues, they are not exposed to the outside environment. Third, vascularity. Many connective tissues are highly vascular, that is, they have many blood vessels. There are exceptions, cartilage for example is not highly vascular, but unlike epithelial tissue, which is avascular, connective tissue is highly vascular. Fourth, connective tissue is innervated. Herein is a similarity to epithelial tissues. Connective tissues are innervated. Connective tissues contain sensory receptors that detect pain, pressure, temperature, and other stimuli. Moreover, connective tissues provide pathways for nerves to reach target organs and cells. When it comes to the physiology of connective tissues, what do connective tissues do? Well, seeing as connective tissue cell types can be very distinct, it should not be surprising to learn that connective tissues play many very distinct functions. A few notable connective tissue functions include support and protection transportation of materials, storage of energy reserves, and defense of the body. Naturally, no cell type in connective tissue plays all of these distinct roles. Specific connective tissue subtypes specialize in these diverse functions. The functions of different connective tissues become more evident when we consider the physical structures of different connective tissue types. Broadly speaking, based on their physical properties, connective tissues are classified into three major types. One, connective tissue proper. Two, fluid connective tissues. Three, supporting connective tissues. Let's begin with connective tissue proper. Connective tissue proper contains a diverse collection of cell types, extracellular fibers, and a syrupy ground substance. Some cells of connective tissue proper are permanent residents while others are not always present. Such cells migrate into connective tissues to defend and repair areas of injured tissue and then leave when they are done. For example, some white blood cells circulate in the bloodstream and then migrate out through the walls of veins where they fight invading bacteria in connective tissues. Connective tissue proper includes four major cell types. First, fibroblasts. Fibroblast cells are the only cells that are always present 
in connective tissue proper. There are also the most abundant, permanent, or fixed cells in connective tissue proper. Fibroblasts produce connective tissue fibers and ground substance. Fibrocytes are next in abundance and differentiate from fibroblasts. Thus, fibrocytes are mature fibroblast cells. The role of a fibrocyte is to maintain the connective tissue fibers of connective tissue proper. Second, macrophages. Macrophages are large phagocytic cells scattered throughout the matrix. These cells engulf damaged cells or pathogens that enter the tissue. They also release cytokine chemicals, which attract additional macrophages and other cells, thus mobilizing the immune system. Macrophages that spend long periods of time in connective tissue are said to be fixed macrophages. When an infection occurs, free or migrating macrophages also enter the affected area. Third, fat cells. Fat cells, or adipocytes, are permanent residents. Fat cells store a large lipid droplet that, when filled, can squeeze the nucleus and other organelles to one side of the cell. The number of fat cells varies from one connective tissue to another, from one region of the body to another, and among individuals. Fourth, mast cells. Mast cells are small, mobile, connective tissue cells often found near blood vessels. The cytoplasm of a mast cell is packed with granules filled with histamine and heparin. Histamine is an inflammatory chemical, and heparin is an anticoagulant. These chemicals are released to begin the body's defensive activities after injury or infection. Beyond these cell types, numerous white blood cells and lymphocytes are also commonly found migrating in connective tissues. Connective tissue protein fibers. These three basic types of fibers are made and secreted by fibroblasts. Collagen. Collagen fibers are long, straight, and unbranched. These strong but flexible fibers are the most common fibers in connective tissue proper. There are several types of proteins that make up the various collagen fibers, type 1 being the most abundant. Elastic fibers contain the protein elastin. Elastic fibers are branched and wavy. While their ability to stretch is a key characteristic, it is their ability to recoil back to their original shape that is their most important feature. Reticular fibers are made up of the collagen protein type 3. They are the least common of the three fibers, and they are thinner than collagen fibers. Reticular fibers form a branching interwoven framework in organs. Ground substance. Ground substance fills the space between cells and surrounds connective tissue fibers. In normal connective tissue proper, it is clear, colorless, and viscous. This viscosity can slow the movement of bacteria and other pathogens, making them easier for immune cells to catch. All of these cell types develop from an embryonic tissue called mesenchyme tissue. Connective tissue proper is divided into two categories, loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. The distinction is made based on the relative proportion of cells, fibers, and ground substance. Loose connective tissues are the packing materials of the body. They fill spaces between organs, provide cushioning, and support epithelia. They also anchor blood vessels and nerves, store lipids, and provide a route for the diffusion of materials. Let's consider several examples of loose connective tissue. First, areolar tissue. Areolar tissue is the least specialized connective tissue in adults. It contains all the cells and fibers found in any connective tissue proper and is highly vascular. Areolar tissue forms a layer that separates the skin from deeper structures. It is called the hypodermis or subcutaneous layer. In addition to providing padding, its elastic properties allow a considerable amount of independent movement. Pinching the skin of your arm does not damage underlying muscle nor does a contracting muscle pull against the skin. The substantial blood supply in this tissue carries migrating cells to and from the tissue and provides nutrients to the integument. Second, adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, or fat, is a loose connective tissue containing large numbers of fat cells, or adipocytes. The difference between loose connective tissue and adipose tissue is simply one of degree. A loose connective tissue is called adipose tissue when it becomes dominated by fat cells. Adipose tissue is another source of padding and shock absorption for the body. It also serves as insulation that slows heat loss through the skin 
and it stores energy. Adipose tissue is more common under the skin in distinct areas of the body. It also fills the bony sockets behind the eyes and surrounds the kidneys, and is common beneath the epithelial lining of the pericardial and peritoneal cavities. 3. Reticular tissue. Reticular tissue is a loose connective tissue whose reticular fibers form a complex three-dimensional network. They stabilize the positions of functional cells in lymph nodes and bone marrow, and in organs such as the spleen and liver. Fixed macrophages, fibroblasts, and fibrocytes are associated with the reticular fibers. These cells are seldom visible, however, because specialized cells with other functions dominate the organs. Dense connective tissues. Dense connective tissues are tough, strong, and durable. They resist tension and distortion and interconnect bones and muscles. Dense connective tissues consist mostly of collagen fibers. For this reason, they are also called fibrous or collagenous tissues. The body has two types of dense connective tissues. In dense regular connective tissue, the collagen fibers are parallel to each other, packed tightly and aligned with the forces applied to the tissue. Tendons are made of dense regular connective tissue that attach skeletal muscles to bones. Their collagen fibers run along the length of the tendon and transfer the pull of the contracting muscle to the bone. Ligaments resemble tendons but connect one bone to another. Ligaments often contain elastic fibers as well as collagen fibers, and thus can tolerate some stretching. In contrast, the fibers of dense irregular connective tissue form no consistent pattern. This tissue strengthens and supports areas subjected to stresses from many directions. Dense irregular connective tissue gives skin its strength and covers bone and cartilage except at joints. It also forms a thick fibrous layer or capsule which surrounds internal organs such as the liver, kidneys, and spleen and encloses joint cavities. On the subject of dense connective tissue, it is worth noting elastic tissue. Elastic tissue is a dense, regular connective tissue made up mainly of elastic fibers. Elastic ligaments are almost completely dominated by elastic fibers. They help stabilize the positions of vertebrae of the spinal column. Next, fluid connective tissues. Blood and lymph are connective tissues that contain distinctive collections of cells in a fluid matrix. The proteins of the ground substance are large, soluble proteins, except under unique conditions such as during blood clotting. In blood, the watery extracellular matrix is called plasma. A single cell type, the red blood cell, accounts for almost half the volume of blood. Red blood cells transport oxygen in the blood. Blood also contains small numbers of white blood cells, important cells of the immune system, and platelets, which are cell fragments that play a role in blood clotting. Together, plasma, lymph, and interstitial fluid make up most of the extracellular fluid of the body. Plasma is confined to the blood vessels of the cardiovascular system and is kept in constant motion by contractions of the heart. As blood flows through body tissues within thin-walled vessels, called capillaries, water and small solutes move from the plasma into interstitial fluid surrounding the body's cells. Lymph forms as interstitial fluid drains into small passageways or lymphatic vessels that eventually return to the cardiovascular system. Along the way, cells of the immune system monitor the composition of the lymph and respond to signs of injury and infection. This recirculation of fluid is essential for homeostasis. The third and final category of connective tissues is the supporting connective tissues, namely cartilage and bone. Cartilage and bone are called supporting connective tissues because they provide a strong framework that supports the rest of the body. In these connective tissues, the matrix contains numerous fibers and, in some cases, deposits of solid calcium salts. First, cartilage. The matrix of cartilage is a firm gel containing embedded fibers. Chondrocytes are the only cells found within cartilage matrix. They occupy small pockets known as lacunae. Unlike other connective tissues, cartilage is avascular, so chondrocytes must obtain nutrients and eliminate waste products by diffusion through the matrix. This lack of a blood supply also limits the repair capabilities of cartilage. The three major types of cartilage are hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. Hyaline cartilage is the most common type of cartilage. The matrix contains closely packed collagen fibers, making hyaline cartilage tough but also flexible. This type of cartilage connects the ribs to the sternum. 
supports the conducting passageways of the respiratory tract, and covers opposing bone surfaces within joints. 2. Elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage contains numerous elastic fibers that make it extremely resilient and flexible. Elastic cartilage forms the external flap of the external ear, the epiglottis, an airway to the middle ear, and small cartilages in the voice box. 3. Fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage has little ground substance, and its matrix is dominated by collagen fibers. These fibers are densely interwoven, making this tissue extremely durable and tough. Pads of fibrocartilage lie between the spinal vertebrae, between the pubic bones of the pelvis, around tendons, and around or within a few joints. In these positions, the pads resist compression. They absorb shocks and prevent damaging bone-to-bone -bone contact. Cartilages heal poorly, and damaged fibrocartilage in joints, such as the knee, can interfere with normal movements. Here we focus on significant differences between cartilage and bone. We will examine the detailed histology of bone in Module 6. The volume of ground substance in bone is very small. The matrix of bone consists mainly of hard calcium compounds and flexible collagen fibers. This combination gives bone truly remarkable properties, making it both strong and resilient to shattering. Like cartilage, the cells of bone, called osteocytes, rest in small pockets called lacunae. Diffusion of nutrients and gases cannot take place through the bony matrix, but osteocytes obtain nutrients through cytoplasmic extensions that reach blood vessels and other osteocytes. These extensions run through a branching network within the matrix called canaliculi. Unlike cartilage, bone is constantly being remodeled throughout life. Therefore, complete repairs can be made even after severe damage. Having now looked at both epithelial and connective tissues, join with me again as we examine tissue membranes. Tissue membranes are physical barriers in the human body made of both epithelial and connective tissues. There we'll see there are four distinct tissue membranes that serve as these physical barriers.